Hi, I'm Stetson Pierce. Uh, I'm giving a talk about debugging in JavaScript, a journey into the unknown, hopefully. Uh, my goal is to hopefully you take something away from this that maybe you didn't know before, um, and it makes you more productive in your day-to-day -day or more productive on your personal projects. And that's what the intention of this was. So uh, before we begin, um, like I said, hour and a half is what I was in, asked to fill, and I did that with ease. I'm a little verbose. If any of you know me, I can talk about things for a very long time. Um, so I will do my best to speed through this. If I'm going too fast, feel free to raise your hand and say, slow it down, pull the reins. If I'm going way too slow, please say, go faster, you're boring us to death. So um, but that being said, I do have a lot of material to cover. So as Samuel Jackson would say, uh, hold on to your butts. So about me, that's me, and that's my beautiful other half. Uh, that is the Wall Street Bowl in New York. So I work at a company called Burcadia. We do commercial real estate. Uh, basically the entire bit of it. We are hiring, it's not a plug, but I love the company. Um, okay, that's weird. Um, I don't know why it's the opposite direction, but there you go. That's me on all the things, on the Twitter, on the GitHub, and I'm in the Utah.js Slack channel, so feel free to reach out to me if anything. I've been using JavaScript in some form or another since about 2011. Um, I've done a lot of back-end stuff, a lot of front-end stuff, and a lot of stuff you haven't thought about. Um, I've done some other things also professionally, they're not important, you're not hiring me. I love JavaScript, but I, I absolutely hate debugging it, or at least I used to really, really hate debugging it, uh, less now. So we're gonna do a quick Gallup poll. When I say debugging JavaScript, how many of you think of this immediately, show of hands? <laughs> this is what you consider debugging JavaScript. Yeah, yeah that's, that tends to be the case. Now I'm not here to knock console log because print, printf debugging is very, very handy. Uh, I'm just here to argue the case that context gives you so much more insight to what your problems actually are, because more often than not, you'll log something, you'll go through it, and you'll go, ah, oh, crap, I logged the wrong thing, or oh, I need to log this other thing too, and then you just end up re redoing and redoing and redoing. It's not super efficient. Um, I'm going to give you one for free. If you don't know about this, you can pass extra things into Stringify so that you can pretty print your, your objects so that they look nice in the console. That's just a give me, but hopefully we're not doing this after today. So, give you a brief history of my experiences and why I hate debugging JavaScript. We're, we're gonna start with, um, did it die? Oh, oh, it died. <laughs> okay. Believe it or not, Microsoft products on a Mac don't work very well. I know, right? All right, can I just skip? Yeah, okay, story time. Uh, but every good story is a horror story, so this is gonna be my experience with debugging. Um, every good horror story needs a villain, and mine is Internet Explorer 9. Um, so, to give you a little bit of history, I worked at a company, a small company, and we had a natively deployed on the thick client app. Uh, it was a C++ code base, and inside of that, we actually had two JavaScript execution runtimes. We had an internal one that basically we took SpiderMonkey, which is Mozilla's Spider uh, JavaScript engine, and we compiled it into our code, gave us all the awesomeness of JavaScript internally. Um, that's not the one we're gonna focus on. We're gonna focus on the external one. And that was basically, we took the Internet Explorer object and we sent stuff to it and hoped that it would work. So to show you what that looks like, imagine I have this, this wonderful desktop application and it's basically running an embedded browser. So this is Electron before Electron was a thing. Um, and what we would do, and I say we as me, I would write some JavaScript, it would dynamically get injected into that page and then I would lose all context into what happened. Um, I didn't have a console, I didn't have any debugging tools, it was literally just a trial and error process. Um, so what I actually did is I wrote my own version of developer tools that I could uh, inject at runtime. Gave me a console, gave me some DOM tree stuff. Very, very basic, I'm not, I am not uh, an expert at this, but it was just enough to get me by. And it really left me feeling like this. Um, and so I'm hoping that you don't feel like this. This is like what I'm hoping to, to prevent you from. So what I'm really gonna focus on is JavaScript as a whole, and that kind of is the browser and kind of Node because they can be debugged the same way nowadays, um, and where debugging sits in 2018. So, uh, debugging JavaScript, I know this is the Node meetup, I'm very much aware, but we're gonna talk about uh, the browser for just a second. So, I have some, a browser, I'm running some JavaScript, everybody knows, you look at your console, that's how you debug, right? It's great, 
node's like, but what about me? I'm like, we'll, we'll get to you. But we're going to focus just on the browser for a second. So uh, when we're talking about JavaScript in the browser, we really are talking about DevTools. I know Firebug was awesome, but nobody uses it anymore. So we're talking about DevTools. So we're going to do a quick tour of DevTools. I'm sure everybody's really familiar, but just in case you're not, we're going to be on the exact same page so we can use the exact same vocabulary. Uh, can, oh, did it die again? Oh my gosh! <laughs> All right, this is going to become a game. We need to develop a drinking game. How many times it crashes? <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, where are we at? Maybe. Okay. Command Shift J, Control Shift J. If you're that kind of a person, um, pulls up the Dev Tools. And you get a window that looks like this. Everybody's seen this. Starts out on elements most of the time. You get your DOM tree, you get your CSS calculations, all that good stuff, which is really great. Um, these are the two tabs that everybody knows, right? Everybody knows elements. Everybody knows console, because that's how we develop today. Um, so console, obviously, is where you get all that stuff. I am going to point out one thing, because not everybody knows this. Um, this default levels drop down right here. Uh, you'll notice that not everything is selected. And console has this debug function that everyone screams at you to use if you're debugging. Um, I don't like it because it doesn't show up unless you have verbose checked, which to me, that's just an extra step to actually try and see what the heck is going on. So it's not super valuable. So I don't like that. But just so you're aware, it's there. What I'm going to mainly focus on tonight, though, is the sources tab, which some people maybe have looked at sometimes, but maybe they haven't dug into it a whole lot. I'm going to just demystify this, this uh, window a little bit. So left-hand pane is where you can see all of the actual sources. So this is basically everything that the browser has uh, loaded, basically. So it's all your HTML, it's all your images, it's all your JavaScript. All the files are right there, so you can actually go and explore them. When you click on them, it opens up in your work panel. So you can actually inspect the contents of those files, make changes, do all that sort of stuff. And then on the right-hand side here, it's kind of a hodgepodge of a bunch of different things, um, which we'll get into a little bit more. Um, but there's some really cool, cool stuff over there that, that we'll talk about. If you didn't know, cool Chrome feature, hit escape on anything that's not console, and woo, up pops the console. So you can always have the console, even outside of console context. So that's really cool. Um, all right, jumping into demo time. Now there's six demos in this. And uh, everybody knows code demos go really well live. So pray for me. <laughs> and let's hope that all of these go smooth. Uh, PowerPoint's not, not making me feel too confident. But uh, this app is built on top of Open Weather Map. Is everybody Open Weather Map? Just free API. You can go get weather data, historical data, temperature, all that sort of stuff. Um, ignore the Polaris Con. So this is the UI. I'm going to walk you through it. Follow, follow with me. I know it's hard, but we're going we're gonna to go through it. So you enter a zip code. You, you hit search. And then your temperature pops up right there. Now I know. I know, uh, but trust me, I'll follow, follow along. We'll, we'll get through it. We'll get through it together. All right, so uh, let's kill this. All right. Uh, OK. Right, I'm going to pop up my dev tools. Can everybody see those OK? Should I make it bigger? Good? Great. Cool. All right, so we're going to debug this together, and we're going to discover a few things together along the way. So again, my user action is, that's my zip code. Um, and I hit search, and huzzah, no temperature. So obviously something is broken. Now, I don't know about you, um, but if I was a new developer coming onto a new project, um, and obviously, this is a really complicated UI. I don't necessarily know where the handlers are for everything. I don't know how everything is composed. I'm not super familiar with the project. But I have a bug I need to fix. And so what do you do in that situation? Most of the time, you run to somebody who's been on the project and be like, how do I do anything? I don't, I don't know where anything lives. Um, I'm going to give you one quick cool tool that I've only ever used like once, but when I used it, it was super, super valuable. Yeah. So in my dev tools over here, in sources, uh, can everybody? It's kind of small. I can't make it bigger, so sorry. Um, at the very, very bottom of this right-hand hodgepodgey panel, I have this event listener breakpoint dropdown. So if you open that up, some of the things in there should look really, really familiar. And that's just because it's normal DOM events that you're used to hooking into to do stuff. Um, you can actually break on them. And if I say that and you don't know what I mean, you're about to find out. So 
If I'm thinking through this as a user, I enter a zip code, I click the search button, and something should happen. So to me, without knowing where this code is actually set up, I can say, OK, I have this, this click somewhere, mouse, mouse. And then I have this click right here. If I click that now, when I go over into my actual app and I click, you notice that it paused on that click event. And what's awesome about that is I had no idea where this code lived. Like, I didn't know where the handler is for this, but it actually broke. Now, you're looking at this and going, what is subscription link post load JS? That doesn't look like anything valuable. Um, this is uh, some code that isn't relevant. Right click, black box it, goes away, and you won't break in it ever again. Very, very valuable, especially for node stuff, because you end up getting into like process next tick. Um, and nobody, nobody cares what process next. It, it just it works, right? We know it works. But huzzah, I'm in actual code now. I think I can make this one bigger. Ah, yeah. All right, I'm in actual code. And you can see I, ha oh, I lost all my, we're going to zoom out just a little bit. Uh, you can see I'm actually in a handler function. So without knowing how I got there, I actually ended up at the actual handler code. So at this point, you can move forward, maybe go open the file and actually make some progress. Um, but I'm here already. So just a quick kind of brief tour, and I'll even do like a quick poll. Who's done like actual breakpoint debugging with JavaScript? OK, a couple people. That's, that's awesome. That makes me really happy, actually. Um, OK, so for those of you that haven't, um, compiled languages have this. Most mature runtimes usually do. But the concept of breakpoints is pause execution at this point in time. And what's really awesome about that is you get all of the context of the current runtime at that point in time. So just a quick kind of this is how you drive it sort of thing. In the top right there, you'll see we have this resume, which basically just means keep going until you encounter another reason to stop, whether that be a breakpoint, an exception, or whatever. Step over is just say, step over the next thing. I don't care what it does. I just want to try and step through my code here. Uh, step into says, that next function that's about to happen, I want to go into it, see what it does, and have context inside of there. Step out of is, I didn't really mean to do that. Take me out, eject, abort. Um, and then step is just execute the next line. So pretty straightforward. Chrome does give you, I'll zoom out a little bit more so you can actually see them. There's this one hiding way, way off on the right there, and it's pause on exception. So it's just if an exception happens, you break at that point so you can get current context. Um, and then this one is just pause all of my breakpoints. And why that one is valuable is if you're sort of debugging like a really complex bug um, and you have a bunch of breakpoints set up and you think you fixed it, you don't want to blow all of those away only to find out you didn't fix it and then have to go and reset them up again. Uh, I've done that I don't know how many times. So that guy just says, leave all the breakpoints in place, but just don't pause on them. And that gives you the ability to then re they see if you actually did fix it. Questions on that so far? How long does that stick? What do you mean, how long does it stick? I mean, is it just the, the one, one time through, or is it uh, So as long as I have uh, something that is debuggable, in the browser it's a little bit different than with Node, and we'll, I'll kind of get to the nuances in a second. But as long as I've broke, like, paused like this, it'll stay until I tell it not to. So you're, you have all context here. Um, so if I look in the middle panel here, and I'm going to ex actually expand this left-hand panel so you can kind of see as well, you'll notice that it actually can show me all of the files getting loaded, which right now I'm in this index.js file, like everybody would expect. And that's actually this file right here. But then I can click on this one. This is, oh, this is the actual index.html file. That's great. There's the CSS file right there. There's an SVG that I'm actually loading in. So there's all the contents of that. But I'm right here, and I can see through this highlighting. That's where I've actually paused execution right now. Um, and what's really cool about this, and again, this console is still your best friend. It's still really valuable. Uh, you just aren't going to be logging to it for everything. Um, I can actually hover over stuff and get insights. And you'll notice on the left here, and I know I'm really plugging browser stuff. We'll get to Node in a second. Um, you can actually see the DOM node that that is actually a reference to. So I know that right now I'm in this on-click handler. It's an arrow function. And all it does is call this search function, passing in this zip code dot value. And you can see as, as I hover, I actually get to see what those values are. I don't have to go looking for them. They're really easily accessible right there for me. Um, also on the right here, I have this scope section and stack section. So scope gives me everything that I have locally, everything that my script has access to, and all of my globals, which is like all my Windows stuff. Uh, really, really cool to see state of your app, right? And what's valuable about this is you get context. And I'm gonna, you're going to hear me say context a lot. If I'm console log debugging, I'm thinking I know what the issue is, I'm firing, praying, and then evaluating. This, you can pause and say, OK, what's actually going on? And you can see all of your current state of your application. Um, so let's debug this. We know that it doesn't work, so let's figure out why it doesn't work. 
Uh, search passing in this value. That looks like it works, but let's go into search now. Maybe it's not making a network request or maybe something's broken there. So I'm going to step into, and now you can see here's where I'm declaring this search function. I'm actually inside of it now. You get this nice little helper of saying here's the param you passed in and there's what the value is. So that's really helpful. Looks like I'm creating a URL. It's not defined right now because I haven't actually executed this line yet. So that's, that's to be expected. So maybe I'll just step next. Now I have URL. If I hover over it, I can see what that is. And that looks special. There's an API key in there. Feel free to be me to open weather map. I don't really care. Um, so that looks fine. Doesn't look weird. But then I get this guy. Uh, and I'll hide this for just, oh, I guess I can't. I'll hide this for just a second. I get this guy, uh, Axios. Axios fans in here? Promises fans in here. Anybody know promises? A little bit? A little bit? OK. How many of you have done promise chains in line and then wanted to debug it? How do you do that? Who wants to take a crack? Yeah? Yeah. OK, so custom solution. Uh, what I would do is I would find the one that I wanted to debug, I'd add parens, I'd next line it, and then I'd console log my context there, and then later I'd go and remove all that, breaking back to one line. Uh, so here's what you can do in Chrome with the dev tools that's super valuable, is if I hover over to the left of any of these lines, I can actually click, and that adds a new breakpoint. And you'll notice there's some ghost breakpoints appearing on that line. So what they actually have given you is introspection into the promise chain. So like. Maybe I want to let this thing fire, see if I get a result back from uh, the Open Weather Map API, and just see what data is. Like, what am I actually getting back? So if I add a breakpoint right there, uh, I'm going to remove this one, and I just say, go ahead and keep going. You notice there was a little pause there. Now I'm broken again. And you notice I'm broken like halfway through this line. I now can hover over data and see the actual data object coming back. And that's super cool. Like, that's, that to me was like one of the coolest features that they gave. Um, all right, so now we're, we're digging a little bit deeper. I'm in this search command. Obviously, search is working. So I'm getting a request back from the Open Weather Map API. So maybe I'm looking for a property that's not correct. Maybe it's not actually there. Maybe there's not a value. So it looks like I'm accessing data.main.temp. And so what's really cool, again, is I can hover over data, hover over main, hover over temp, definitely getting a value back. What's also really cool um, is I can say, what is data right now in the console? And the console keeps context of whatever your current break position is. So if you need to evaluate some expression, like you have some ternary that you're like, I don't know what this is going to do. You can write it down here and actually see what it's going to do. Uh, does do mutations. This is JavaScript, so please don't change stuff. You will alter the state of your application. But yeah, very, very valuable. Um, so it looks like temp is correct, right? We're definitely getting something back. So it looks like the next step is that I pass it into this update temp UI function. OK, so maybe that's the problem. So I'll just go, oh, there it is. Add a breakpoint, say keep going. Now we're here. All right, so now this thing only does one thing. So obviously, there's something wrong here. Let's figure out what it is. Maybe my selector's bad, right? So let's, oh, document uh, get element by ID. It's current temp. Uh, no, that's a span. Uh, OK, so what if I did? dot value equals test. OK, obviously that didn't work. Oh, know what it is? Spans don't have a value. Spans have inner HTML, right? Everybody knows that. <laughs> so if I change this to inner, thanks. Thanks, Ethan. Uh, inner HTML, oh, look at that. You can actually see it reflect the change. So obviously that's my bug. I'm accessing a property that doesn't exist. So what's my workflow? Uh, who's encountered like a debugging situation like this before? Anybody? where you found the bug, you know in the code where it is, now you have to go and fix it. Yeah? OK, good. Most of you are, are actual developers. Um, OK, so for me, what I usually do is I change it here, inner HTML. That's the bug. I save that. Resume, pause, and say, does it work? Yeah, it works. Somebody give me another zip. 840. 1.5. Sounds good. Cool, 87.8. So it's obviously working. But am I there yet? No, right? My, my code doesn't have that change, just the browser does. So we pull up VS Code, we go and find that JavaScript file, we now change it here, enter HTML, save it, we now go back to the browser, we now refresh, oh, now we got a hard refresh, okay, good, got it, now let's do it again, 84047, 
huzzah, I did fix the bug. Um, that workflow is fine because obviously you're getting context that helps you debug faster. But there is another little bit that I would like to show you that's, for me, was really, really valuable. I'm going to change this back to inner. Uh, we're going to hard refresh so the bug is there. Uh, if I expand this a little bit, you notice at the very top here there's this page tab. Um, but there is this file system tab also. So what's really cool about this is if I add a folder, uh, we'll go here, demos here, add that guy, allow it. You can now see the entire contents of my working directory there. Uh, here's that index file. So if I change it here, uh, or inner HTML, whatever. It wasn't right, but whatever. Um, I change it here. Bugs fixed, right? I can now say 4047, search. It works. What's really cool is if I go back to VS Code, it actually makes the change to my file system. So I don't ever have to leave the context of the debugging tools, and it can actually go back to my file system. So I don't have to like, keep switching context to do all these changes. I can just stay where I'm at, make the change. Um, and what's really cool about this is if you have a source map, it also works. So if you've Babelified, if you are webpacking, or whatever, as long as you have a source map and it can figure out what the original code looked like, it can modify it for you and save it. So that, that to me was like, blew my mind. It was awesome. Cool questions on that? No? Cool. All right. Uh, close that. Kill that. All right. So that's you guys right now. <laughs> You're like, wow, that's pretty cool. That's sweet. Yeah, all right. All right, so we've been talking about JavaScript in the browser. I know that's not why we're here. So yeah, we're going to talk about Node. So let's focus on Node for just a second. Oh, the animations are so good. I spent so much time on the animations. That's probably why it keeps crashing. Um, <laughs> so for Node, uh, we're going to travel back in time a few years um, because Node has two debugging protocols. Uh, the first one is the legacy protocol. Yes, I did do this awesome Photoshop job. Um, yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, so the first pr uh, protocol is actually the legacy protocol, is what it's called nowadays. So uh, if we look at this, uh, I have a console. Notice I'm running node version 6, which is when um, legacy was still just the standard debugging uh, protocol. I have a, an app that I pass three command line parameters to. I just pass it three things. Um, and think of it like a locker, like in school. So you have three numbers. The codes have to fit a certain criteria to be valid. And this is just a CLI application I wrote. Um, and it'll tell you whether or not the codes you've passed it are valid or invalid, right? Pretty straightforward. So if we look at this, the first set of rules, and I'm going to call on people, so be paying attention. So the first number you pass in has to be greater than 9, less than 15. Second number is greater than 2, less than 7. Third number is greater than 7, but less than your first number. Everybody good? So if I passed in 10, 6, 9, would that pass my validation rules? Yes. Who's a brave soul? Yes? I hear yes? Yeah, absolutely. That's totally valid. What about 14, 15, 13? No. no, not valid. Very good. Second set of rules. Greater than 3, less than 9. Uh, your second number is greater than your first number, but less than your third number, and your third number is always 20. Pretty straightforward? 9, 10, 20. Does that work? No, no. no it does not, because 9 is not less than 9. <laughs> yeah, I'm that kind of guy. <laughs> All right, 5, 8, 10. Hard no, right? 10 is not 20. Cool. Straightforward. Everybody understands how this application works. Sweet. Uh, oh, did it crash again? No? Oh, thank you. Okay. Demo time. So second demo. Switch back here. Oh. Okay. So, uh, just for posterity's sake, I have, can everybody see that code? Okay, yell if you can't see it. Um, I have a couple of NPM scripts set up that just pass through successful cases. The focus of this talk is not testing, so I'm not using a testing library. Um, I just know that these things will or will not work. So success one passes through 1069, which we said validates our first set of rules. Uh, su success two passes in 8720, which should validate the second set of rules. And then obviously fail one and two are the same fail cases that you saw on the slides. So those should technically fail the rules, OK? Everybody straightforward with that? Yeah? Cool. So if I go to this project, I can use npm uh, run success one. 
And we would expect this to succeed. So when I run that, oh, see? I'm smart. I plan for my, my, own, <laughs> my own mistakes. All right, npm run success one, and I get, hey, codes are invalid, try again. So obviously I'm not off to a great start. Uh, let's run success two. Same result. All right, good. I'm consistent. Let's run fail one, and let's just see if something's weird. All right, nothing is working. So obviously this application is not working. So let's, let's go ahead and take a look at how we debug this um, in the world of debugging in Node uh, a couple of years ago. So um, normally when I run my app, I would go Node, and just like you can see in the script here, Node, the file I'm going to execute, and then passing in my CLI stuff there. I'm just going to copy this whole line, paste that. So if I run that, that's effectively what NPM was just doing for me. In order to get debugging, in between Node and the thing I'm actually telling Node to evaluate, I can throw in this debug command. When I do that, ooh, yeah, I'm dropped into an awesome debugger. So how many of you have debugged Node like this before? Ethan? OK, so this was my life for a long time. Um, so as I go through this and show you how painful it is, uh, you can empathize with me. So I'm dropped in. Um, and I have no idea what to do. So what do I do when I'm in a shell and I have no idea what to do? You yell for help, right? Okay, commands I can run. So just to give you context, this is not actually running your script you told it to run. It is running a application that is then running the script you told it to run. So you think of it as hoisted up out of your script. So that lets me do things like kill, meaning terminate my program, I can restart it, uh, just kidding, run, and then it reruns it with the same execution that I passed in, so that 10.6.9 should still technically be preserved. Um, I'm going to clear that. Let's type help again. All right, so I've got run, continue, next, step. Those are some things that you should be familiar with now because Chrome gave those to me, right? So those are that concept's not super foreign to you. Um, out, super straightforward. Backtrace, if I t uh, throw that guy in there, that's just my stack. So I can see kind of what my call execution was, where in my files I'm at. Um, so that's you know useful. It's great. Uh, SB set breakpoint. I can say, hey, I want a break right there, or clear breakpoint, right? Clear it. Or breakpoints. What's my current list of breakpoints? Which right now, if we do that, you get this lovely readable object um, that's really intuitive. Uh, so it looks like I'm on line zero, column ten. Okay, that's okay. So this is obviously broken before the act actually has run. So that's OK, cool. That's great. That's super helpful. Uh, let's type list uh, help. OK. But at this point, you're saying to yourself, well, where's the code? Like, I, can't, I don't know what I'm debugging anymore. I've lost all context. So that's what uh, list is for. If you type list, it's a function. Um, it shows you where you're at in execution with some padding on top and bottom. Right now, I'm at the top of my file. So I don't get anything on top, but I get six lines by default. That is configurable through this lovely params thing. I can say list 100, and it gives me 100 lines on top and bottom of where I'm at uh, in my file. So you can see right here, I get this nice highlighting. I'm at the very top of this file. So it looks like the first thing I do is just check to see if I'm using the right node version. That code works. We saw my mistake earlier, so we know that code works. Uh, it looks like I'm declaring some functions here. Functions, functions, functions. OK, down here is where stuff actually is happening. So. OK, let's, let's maybe break on 47, because that's where like, the meat of this application actually happens. So let's set breakpoint at 47. Right, that seems intuitive. Cool, that seemed like it worked. So let's say continue. Awesome, all right. Let's list maybe 20, give myself some, some space. All right, so now I can see I'm paused here, 47, right? So uh, if we just evaluate this code, again, I'm not asking you to judge my code. I'm just saying look at it. Um, I'm using a package called Yargs. If you don't use it for Node, it's great. It handles all the, the parsing of CLI stuff for you. It's really handy. Um, so this is an Args-ism, or Yargs-ism. So I have this argv object that I get, and the underscore prop should contain just stuff I passed in. So it looks like I'm destructuring all that out into a new array, passing it in to check codes. So my first thought is maybe I'm not pulling the right property. Maybe I'm sending in nothing. So here's what I can do. Help. What, do I, what can I do here? I have, I have these two commands, REPL and EXEC. So uh, if I say REPL loop or REPL, who knows what I'm saying? 
read, execute, process, and print, print and listen. Yeah, loop, whatever. Uh, basically what this does is it drops me into my node context. Now I'm inside of it, so I can say things like, what is this right now? What is argv, right? And I can get context into that. I don't like that very much. Um, so you also get this exec command, like this, which just lets you pass expressions in, and it does the exact same thing. So instead of being dropped into it, you just say, go execute, give me whatever you have. So I can do the same thing, like what is argv, right? Same thing. You just don't leave the context of what you're doing. Um, so it looks like I do have, so if I do underscore, I have all of my things. So maybe that's not the problem. So let's list. Um, I am destructuring it, so maybe I'm doing something weird. I don't know. Um, but it looks like if this check codes function returns false or anything that would be interpreted as falsy, um, that just means that the codes are invalid. My guess is that's what's happening, right? Because it seems like everything's falling down to line 52 and just saying, hey, everything's invalid. So maybe the problem's inside of check codes, right? So let's maybe, maybe step. What's that command again? Help, step, or out? Is it next? Step, maybe? OK, step, step, step. OK, now I'm on line 8 all of a sudden. OK, that's be OK, right, I'm in the same file, gotcha. All right, so if I list 100, you can see, hey, here's where you were, right? It's kind of off into the side, but here's where you were, here's where you are. So I'm in this function here. So it looks like if, okay, who spots the bug? Anybody? No? So if code's length is greater than three, obviously that's not gonna ever be true because I'm only supposed to pass three in. That's the bug right there, sweet. So let's flip on over to VS Code here. Uh, we'll just say equals equals, or equals equals, no com no coercion here. No, nah, we'll just do two. Three is fine. Fine, we'll do three. Please the masses. Um, okay, so that's that should fix it, right? So back in here, um, I can restart my app. So now it pulls in the new code from my file system, right? So I've got my new code. I'm not I sure if you have three equals, I might be lying. You're okay. There is a difference between the two, but we're not. That's not the focus yeah, yeah. of this. I'm not, I'm it's how they evaluate actual expressions. It's it's will it, it will try and coerce the type of what it's. Never had at least three to know very well, right? Nah, that's fine. Um, okay, so we're gonna continue. This is why you come here. Yeah. So I'm back where I was, and I'll here. Here's what I'll do. So here, it's, at least it's up at the top. I'm back where I was, where I set my breakpoint. So let's go ahead. Step into. Step into. Step into. Okay. Equals equals three. Great. So here's what I can also do. I will say, is that going to actually return true? So let's say codes <coughs> length equals equals three. Yeah, sweet. Totally fixed the bug. Nice. Continue. Ah, codes invalid. Try again. Damn it. Uh, OK, so maybe that was it. But maybe we've got more bugs going on. OK. So again, let's list 100. Oh, wait. I'm not anywhere. Sweet. And I totally just broke the debugger. This wasn't planned at all. Trust me. So we're going to open up a new one. Kill that. Ooh. Uh, OK. Node meetup demos. No one. Uh, OK. Let's go node debug index.js 10, 6, 9. OK. Uh, let's, let's go set breakpoint. 47. Oh, dang it. <laughs> Sorry, ignore the man behind the mirror. All right. OK. All right, back where we were. Um, check code seems to be fine. So let's continue. Oh, dang it. This is what debugging used to be like, guys. This seriously was a nightmare. Uh, step into, step into, OK. OK. So now I'm inside of this check codes function. Obviously, the length checking is correct now. But it looks like I'm now going into this check rule sets function, passing in those codes. Maybe that's what's wrong. Obviously, something's weird there. So let's step into, step into, OK. 
Now I'm inside of this guy. Um, the bug should be immediately obvious, but I can clearly see that the bug, obviously I wrote the bug, so I know what it is. Um, but I'm looking at codes one greater than nine. Okay, so here's where this, this ev uh, expression evaluation comes in handy. I can say, what's this going to be right now, right? So will this be valid? Okay, so that's false. Oh, a razor zero index in JavaScript, not one indexed, right? All right, I must have just been uh, crazy for a second. So I'm not going to change this. Yeah, I have. Um, yeah, that's fine. Uh, I have a branch where this is already fixed already because I am not going to make that change. OK, so now if I list 100. We can see, oh, I'm doing normal good arrays again, things that make sense in the world. So now, hopefully, we continue. Success! Codes are valid. We fixed it. So now, obviously, I'll break out npm run. Success 1 is what we just ran, so this should be successful. Success 2, sweet, also. Now let's just make sure my failure conditions work. Code's invalid, awesome. Fail 2. Also invalid, sweet, so I totally fixed the bug. Awesome. Jump back here. All right, so that was awesome. You guys loved that, I know. You guys are feeling a lot like this. You've conquered the machine. You're, yeah, you just have the power. It's also how Vim users feel. Um, yeah, that always makes the, yeah, that always makes the Vim users struggle. All right, so here is the Node 6 documentation. Uh, back in time, I went to go get these. But you can see it talks about this thing called Inspector. Um, and it's saying that, hey, this is experimental. You can start it, but it's not really landed yet. So use it your own discretion. Fast forward to LTS version 8. And now um, it has replaced a the legacy debug protocol altogether. So now Inspector protocol has replaced it. So what does that actually mean? Um, well, we'll get into it in a second. So we're going to talk about the Inspector protocol. I also did this Photoshop, so thank you. Yeah, I, I'm very clever. Um, all right, so if we take a look at the same application, you'll notice the only difference really is I pass inspect instead of debug, right? So on the surface, it doesn't look that great. And yes, I know, another demo. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about it and why it's actually a really cool thing. So if we jump into here, we'll go open up this guy. Slash or two. Um, and I actually, just for posterity's sake, have the exact same um, setup as I did with that CLI application. So we can just take a look at it. We're not going to debug it again. You guys know what the problem is. But um, just to show you what the, the big differences are. So if I gauno, gauno, now go node uh, inspect that index file 10.6.9, load this up. Oh. What? Cannot find module node inspect. OK. LS. Hold on. That's what it is. It doesn't exist. Uh, OK. So immediately, um, there is one thing that's very, very different. Who, who knows what it is? Yeah, he says I'm listening on a WebSocket, so that's different. But what else is different? So if I type help, because I don't know what to do, um, other than being wrapped in the new function module stuff, um, it's now formatted. And I have descriptions so that I don't have to like reason about and mystify about what the commands actually do. Um, so there's some really nice, nice explanation. Here's what you can do. The things that are particularly awesome uh, that are added are these guys right here. So profiling, you can now do CPU profiling here. You can also take a, a heap snapshot to see if you're leaking memory, stuff like that. Really, really cool. I'm not going to focus on it, but there's a lot of cool stuff you can do there. Um, and the reason you get this for free is because the Chrome team spent a lot of time taking the browser version of debugging JavaScript, which they call the inspector model, and they made a PR into Node. So now Node can be inspected the exact same way browser JavaScript can in Chrome. And what's awesome about that, if you're future telling, is that if I now, I have this little server here. So I'm going to say um, npm run server. Server listening on port 3000. If I switch over to Chrome now, um, you see this 
cool little badge firing up here. So if I open this up, let's close all these, um, I get the dedicated Node DevTools. So what is really awesome about this is it's all the power of Chrome DevTools, just stripped out for the stuff that browsers care about, and it works with Node. So you do have to be on the inspector protocol for this to work, so just heads up there. But uh, this is pretty sweet. Like This is really, really cool. Um, yeah. Um, so let's go back into here. So you guys are looking at the console going, you know, I really hate this. This sucks. You can pass things through like this now, dash dash inspect. So that's what's really cool about this, because when you do that, you actually see that it starts up, but I'm not immediately dropped into that horrible, horrible, horrible debugging experience, which makes you go, yeah, OK, thank god. Um, but then you should start scratching your chin and going, OK, that looks like a WebSocket. So that means, obviously, I can, I can do something with that. So in comes Chrome for the win. You get this awesome guy. He'll come to life. He's green. He says, I, I detect something on this port. You open it up, and huzzah. You get all those same same things, and you even get console output right there. So now you're a blessing. Yeah, that's you guys. All right, so we're gonna go into another demo. So uh, let's go over here. So if I yeah, yep. Uh, so instead of doing npm, I'm gonna say no dash dash inspect. That index uh, server JS. Just kidding. Cool. So now over here, you can see. Hey, server listening on port three thousand. Go to sources. Go, oh, cancel. Go to this node drop down. Open all this up. There's all these internal garbage here. Uh, look, there's that server. So there's my code that's actually getting run. You notice that it doesn't look pretty. It's wrapped in the node module things that it does to export stuff. So what we're going to do is do this exact same file system stuff. Open this up. Go and tell it. Go here. Allow that. You notice that immediately is transformed because it understands that that's not actually what my file looks like. So now I can actually see the contents of that that uh, server JS file. So. Uh, we are going to debug here. I know you guys love debugging, but that is what I'm doing, so it's to be expected. So here's the intended behavior of this app. I have a root route that, when I hit it, should send me back a success and a current count of how many requests have been made to the server. Very, very simple. Obviously, it's already wrong, because I just made a request, so zero is not correct. Um, the other behavior is that I have this other route, and when I hit it, it not only gives me back a success, but it gives me the current count of just this route. Now, that would still increment the total request to the server, so I'd expect this one to affect the other one also. So let's just check this one. Looks like this one's working, and you can see my logs right here. I'm actually logging the number of requests, so I have that information somewhere. I'm just obviously not doing the right thing with it. So if I go back to this just main route, that's just for posterity. Yep, definitely broken. All right, so looking at this, um, I have all these cool, cool things that the dev tools give me. Maybe let's just like, let's just break right here. Go through, send a request. Uh, what? <laughs> oh, just kidding. Let's break there. That's already been evaluated. OK, now I'm broken. Um, so that's pretty cool, right? So let's, let's look. It looks like I'm just sending back a static object. I got success. Got this count property. And it's this rec counter. OK. I'm never actually doing anything with rec counter. Oh, you know what? I refactored this code. I remember. I originally had all the code for keeping track of that count here, but I actually put it in its own file. That's what this guy is, this counter. So let's look at him. Oh, yeah, this is where I'm logging. So it looks like I've got this rec counter that I'm incrementing with every single request. Um, I'm logging that out, and I'm attaching it to this app.locals rec count. OK. So back here. Um, I obviously don't need this anymore, so let's just forget about it. What did I say that was? It was rec, rec dot something. That's rec dot app dot locals. Oh yeah, there's my rec counter right there. So again, getting all this console stuff, context of where you're actually at. So I can say, oh right, this is rec dot app dot locals dot what was it? Rec count. 
not rec counter. Save that. Go ahead and continue on. Let's actually restart the server. Go back over here. I'm going to gotta minify this. Tell my breakpoints to pause. Notice I still have a ghost of it, but I'm just saying I don't want you to actually break because I just want to see if I actually fix the bug. So now when I send a request, hey, count one, count two, sweet. Let's make sure I didn't break this one. So I would expect this one to be one and one, which means if I went back here and sent this again, I would expect count to be what? Four, right? Send, sweet, fix the bug. We're so good at this. All right. Sweet. So. Chrome is awesome, Chrome DevTools are great, and I'm not knocking Chrome, um, but what's really cool about it just being a WebSocket and a generic protocol is that other things can actually attach to it. Things like uh, VS Code, right, is a really good example, especially for Node, because I don't love going to Chrome to debug Node stuff. So um, in VS Code, you have this lovely debug icon. When you click on it, you get this panel. You can add configurations from here. It's just a JSON object with some pre-configurations um, that will actually allow you to launch the debugger, attach to a remote uh, process that's running, do all kinds of really cool stuff. So yeah, another demo. I told you there's a lot of demos in this talk. All right, so if I now, I'm going to fire up my server doing the exact same thing, telling it to start up. I could go to Chrome and do that, which it automatically attaches. I'm going to kill that because I don't want it to do that. But I'm here in VS Code, so let's go ahead and open up my debug. Up here, uh, this launch.json file just gets stored at the root in a .vs code directory, so you can commit it. Like, uh, if you add it to your version control, you can share it across teams. So if you guys have a debugging schema that you like to use, uh, you can share it with your teammates. Or if you just like to do things a certain way, maybe all of your teammates don't like to do it this way, you can just have it locally, it doesn't matter. Um, but we'll get rid of this guy. All I can do, and this is what's really cool, this big add configuration button, it has a bunch that I can just be like, oh yeah, that sounds like what I want. So I want node attach. Yeah, that sounds right. So node attach, attach to this uh, specific port. So the default port for the inspector protocol is 9229. For uh, the legacy protocol, it's 5858 or 5885, one of the two. It's got fives and eights in it. Um, so once I've got that, I can save it. I just click this play button. And now you see I get all those same stepping tools right here inside of VS Code. But what that also means I can do is go open up the server file, and I can say I want you to break right there. And now when I go to Postman and run it, I'm actually breaking inside of VS Code. And what's cool is I don't lose anything. Like I still have all the same debugging tools I had before, right? I have my call stack. I have uh, watchers are really, really cool. You can do them in the other tool. But basically, you can just say, here's an expression I want you to always be evaluating so I can just like know what's going on. And even if it's like an undefined thing, like say you have, I don't know, like I said, a ternary or something where you're like, at some specific points, this matters to me. You can just throw it in here, and then at every single breakpoint, that gets evaluated, so you can see what it would evaluate to at that point. And you can throw anything in there. It's just a JavaScript expression. Um, but I also get all of my variables. So I get my context. I get what this is. What does rec look like? Right? So I use full context into what I'm doing. So that's, that's pretty cool. And this is the feature that sold me on VS Code uh, back when this landed as, as like a supported feature. I was a very avid Sublime user for a long time, but this was like, pff, changed my life. Uh, cool. Questions so far? Uh, so in Node 6, it was an experimental <coughs> feature. So you can try it. I wouldn't expect it to work reliably. But as of 8 and greater, um, it is LTS supported. It's the way they're doing things. So. Um, OK, so we've talked about some cool things, but we're going to talk about the elephant in the room. This is a very obvious thing if you're dealing with Node. It's really more of a whale. Uh, let's talk about Docker. So how many people use Docker today? OK, so uh, to give you some context about Bercadia as an organization, um, we use Make as our entry point into stuff. Make then drives Docker Compose, and this is just for local, uh, then drives Docker Compose to orchestrate containers locally. Um, there's some decisions about why we do that. I didn't make them, but that is just what we are at today. So Docker. I have this browser app, and it's running in a Docker container locally on my machine. Can I debug that? 
Yes or no? Sure. Absolutely, right? Super easy. How do I do it? Does anybody want to take a crack at how I do it? Chrome. Yeah. Open the dev tools. It just works. Right? Chrome loads all of the execution stuff for you. You don't have to make any modifications to your container. Nothing special. You can just do it. It's great. It's awesome. Uh, opens it up like you would normally expect. Here's the guy. No. Well, your app's already running on whatever port you're accessing it through. So assuming you can get to it in the browser, it has all of the context there. You don't get all the same file system stuff. Like You'd have to do some tweaks there if you want that. But that's not the focus. <laughs> um, here's the big one, though. I've got my laptop. I've got a Docker container. It's running some node. Can I debug that? Because we already talked about the node protocol, the debug inspect protocol, doesn't run on port 80. It doesn't run on port 443. It runs on 9229. So can I do that? The answer is absolutely. But to do that, we're going on an adventure. So every good adventure starts with a treasure map, of course. Uh, so we're starting at Docker. And we've got to make this crazy, crazy path to debugging JavaScript. And along the way, we have to worry about these things like NPM. Kubernetes is a thing I hear. And then we have Docker Compose. Do I use that? Or do I use Kubernetes? Or how do I actually do the thing? Um, we're here. And I will be your guide, and I will show you how to actually do this. Um, I'm not going to toot my own horn. This was hugely impactful at our organization, because nobody had this set up on any of our containers. And we are microservices at Bercadia, um, which means we have a lot of Kubernetes instances running, which means we are 100% container-based, which means people were doing console debugging a lot. And so uh, I gave this talk about two weeks ago at work, um, and I had people giving me hugs, saying how grateful they were. So. Um, <laughs> And I was like, Ethan, like, I get it, but. <laughs> um, OK. So I've got this project caused, called Compose Dat. So I'm going to run you through it really quickly. Uh, I didn't do any weird gotchas. This, this just works. There's no debugging here. I'm just showing you how you can actually do it. Um, so I ripped out Make for the sake of you guys don't care about Make. It is an old technology. Um, I'm just using Bash. So you've got a shell script set up. Uh, can everybody see that? So it does two commands. It tells Docker Compose to build. And then it says, hey, Docker Compose run, expose your service ports, and run app start. Okay, so what that means, if I look at my Docker Compose YAML file, and this is not a Docker course, so I'm not going to explain this in huge numbers of depth. But basically, services app, that's saying build this thing. Um, ports are what I have mapped from. And I'm running Docker native, not Docker machine. That's a big distinction here. Um, I'm saying map my Docker port 3000 to my local host, uh, host port 3000. So that if there's something running in Docker on that port, uh, forward all my traffic on the same port to that port. And that just basically exposes that server um, on port 3000. I have this Docker file. And all it does is say, hey, we're, this is a Node 8 app. You're going to build it to this slash app directory in the container. Um, and then it does its uh, install stuff. And then this entry point thing is really uh, important. It says, hey, uh, handle this through NPM. And what that means is that the shell command here that says app start, the start piece of this is going to fall through to NPM. And NPM immediately knows what start is. So if you just run NPM start, it's a, it's a default command. So whatever you have as your start script, it'll do it. If it's something like debug, right? That's not a standard command. You have to say like NPM run debug. You could do that right here. You could say run script whatever I want. And it would fall through to NPM just, just for, for your sake. Um, and then I have this server, has one route. All it does is at the root just sends me back a JSON object that just says success one. All right, so if I kill this, uh, if I say npm, or let's go bash, what is this? Docker compose, nope. Boom, port 3000. So if I run Postman now, Cool. So my app's working, exposed locally. It does what I intended to do. But I want to get some debugging context there. It's very simple to do. Um, yeah, and I'll show you how to do it. So the first thing we need to do um, is if we think about this, take it down to the very, very bare bones, how do I actually start node in debug mode? Right? I have to pass through that inspect command. So if I go to npm, it looks like I have this start command. All it's doing is saying node that server. right? Um, so let's do this. Let's add another one, call it debug. 
Let's say node inspect uh, server JS. Okay, fair. Everybody following along so far? So now, if I run that command instead of start, theoretically, node should start up in debug mode, right? Cool. Um, so now I've got to be able to talk to that somehow. For my sake, I'm just going to say run debug here. Right, so that should theoretically get that to start. So let's just test that to begin with, make sure that I'm not crazy. It's fine, it's fine, it's fine, boom. Sweet. So it's totally working, right? I'm getting this, hey, I'm listening on a WebSocket. That means it's definitely running in debug mode. Great. Let's kill it. We're not there yet. Who knows why? Exactly. Yeah, so I've exposed port 3000, but I haven't exposed my node port yet. So I can just add that here. Again, this isn't a Docker course, 9229, 9229. You should just care about, hey, map, map my host machine to my Docker thing, and it's just going to parallel the port. So, OK, so now at this point, I've got node running in debug mode. So it's producing a WebSocket on a particular port. Um, I have now exposed that port through Docker. It should work, right? Let's run it. Let's find out. Building, building, building. All right, sweet. It's up on debug. So let's. Uh, we're going to use VS Code for this. Uh, we could use Chrome, but we're just going to. We're going to use VS Code. Um, there are some extra things if you're going to attach to a Docker instance rather than just attaching locally. It's just extra configurations. There is a uh, Docker extension for VS Code that gives you like this add configuration button that I was showing you earlier. Um, all of this Docker one here doesn't come with it normally. Um, this Docker extension gives it to you and it fills in all of this stuff for you, which is nice because I could never remember all of it off the top of my head. So basically all you're saying is, hey, locally, where, where does this live? On the remote container, what's the actual directory it's being built to? And so if you remember from my Docker file, I'm building it to this slash app directory in the container. So uh, this is just saying that's where it lives in the container. Um, and then it's just protocol of inspector. Those are the only extra things you need to do because it needs to know where to go to find code um, and you deal with source maps and all that sort of stuff. So just a few extra little configurations you have to make. So if I run this now, you can see VS Code's thinking about it, it's thinking about it, it's thinking about it still thinking about it, really, really thinking about it. And eventually, I get this message. Now, I was done with this talk. And I went to the person who asked me to do it. And I said, hey, this talk's done. And he's like, well, yeah, but can you get Docker to work? And I said, I guess so. Um, <laughs> and then I got to this point on my own and encountered this situation and banged my head for like two days trying to figure out like, why. Why isn't this working? Asked everybody I could. Nobody could help me figure this out. People who are really, really familiar with Docker. And we had one of our uh, architecture people in from back east. And I said, hey, Dave, do you know why this doesn't work? He took one look at it and was like, oh, yeah, you're not doing this thing. And I was like, <laughs> I cried a little. Uh, so I'm going to share with you the secret, because uh, it took me a really long time to figure it out. So here's this funny thing about Docker and Docker Compose. Um, by default, and if I pull up the console, you'll see this. This fires up on 127.0.0.1. If you want anything to work inside of Docker, it has to be launched on universal host, which is 0.0.0.0. That was the problem. Uh, stupidly simple. So how do I do that? So I, I, I jump to Google. I go find it. And uh, it's surprisingly super easy. So if I come back to this, where I have inspect uh, equals 0.0.0.0 colon 9.2.2.9. Uh, we'll escape those, save that, kill that, run it again. OK, now I see that, and that's better. <laughs> so now if I'm in VS Code, run this, it attaches. So now what's cool is I have that breakpoint set up, I can hit and huzzah, it breaks. But this is running in the container on my laptop, which means I don't have any of the dependencies installed in my host machine. It's all within the container. So yeah, you don't have to actually run anything locally. You can actually debug a Docker console. Everything I found on Docker was for 
the legacy protocol, nobody covered Docker Compose. It was really, really frustrating finding resources on this. So uh, yeah, ping me if you have questions, if you need to reproduce this on your own, because it was a serious nightmare for me. Um, all right. Uh, skip, skip. Questions? Anything anybody wants to ask me right now? No? Actually, I have a question about for Katie. Yeah. Yes, we do. Um, we do use Node. We have some, so like I said, we're microservices. So we do primarily Node on our microservices. We have some services in Go, and a couple of us are pushing to maybe use Elixir because Erlang is really cool. Um, but right now it's primarily Node. And then on the front end, we're using a lot of Angular, uh, 2 Plus, and React. But there's definitely. Uh, the organization as a whole is really awesome, and if you have a good idea, uh, you don't get shot down. So if you have a good idea and people like the idea, it will get incorporated, which is how we ended up with Go services. So, how, yeah. How are you able to get into like, an internship-type program in that? Come talk to me after this, and I'll show you. I'll talk to you about it. So I don't know. So I know you, so Microsoft is building cool stuff for Azure uh, as far as debugging and attaching to this protocol. I don't know about Lambda, to be honest with you. Can you repeat the question? Oh, sure. Yeah, he was, it was about Lambda and, and actually debugging Lambdas. And I, honestly, I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> I wish I did. Is it, well, apart from the video, is this your slides or anything like that publicly available? No. But I can make them. Um, I will funnel the information to somebody somehow. Please do. I will. <laughs> yeah, and uh, the code, I'll, I'll release the code also so you can look at it. There's nothing special there. But mainly that last one, just with the configuration stuff, that's the, the big one. Um, I am on Twitter. I'm on GitHub. I'm on the Utah.js Slack channel. You can find me there. Feel free to ping me. I'm a nice person. You can approach and ask me questions. Uh, anything else? Yeah. We are absolutely hiring. 100%. I do most of the interviews, so uh, you've got a leg up. I already like you, so. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, we are, we are hiring for all levels. We're hiring juniors, mids, and seniors, so. Anything else? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, as long as it has a source map, so assuming you ship with the source map, which Webpack will do for you by default, um, yeah, you can debug it. Anything else? Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you, guys. I appreciate it.